All right, that should conclude um, our voting council members, um, the council representatives from New York State Police as well as NYPD, and all the agenda uh, presenters and active participants uh, in the meeting. I know we have others who are signed on, uh, listening on, um, but uh, Chair Spike, for the purpose of this council meeting, we are all set with the con connectivity of uh, the four council members, yourself, Chief Timothy Parisi, Dr. Bruce McBride, and Dr. John Clofus, and representatives from the New York State Police, um, Colonel Matthew Reneman, and um, representative from NYPD, Deputy Chief uh, Timothy Baudet. So we are all set. I'll turn it over to you, Sheriff Spike. Okay, uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, do you hear me okay? I can. Okay, uh, I officially uh, open and welcome everyone uh, virtually or electronically to this uh, 251st remote meeting of the Municipal Police Training Council. Uh, this is our third meeting uh, this year and the second one uh, done uh, remotely. Uh, I thank uh, Josh Weinhardt for uh, confirming that uh, everyone is on the air and we have uh, our four uh, uh, voting uh, members present uh, today on the council. Uh, today, uh, we're going to consider several important action items, and then we'll have some informational uh, and some update, updates uh, from the DCGS Deputy Commissioner, and uh, that'll include use of force and police community guidance, and then be updated on some instruction instructor issues. Uh, first, uh, as chairman, I would like to make some introductory remarks, uh, and I'd like to comment on the 135-page uh, police reform and reinvention resource guide that only local village, town, and city police and sheriffs received from the governor's office uh, approximately two weeks ago. The MPTC and its work on model policies is first mentioned in this document at page 75. And I appreciate the uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, speaking on this later in this meeting, as this does have challenges for police administration and training. Uh, the MPTC members, along with our partner DCJS, especially the Office of Public Safety, have spent countless hours for the betterment of law enforcement training in New York State. I, for one, have been a member of this council for over 20 years, and although some training for the basics has remained constant, many changes have come about just this current and this past year alone, as we are now challenged by a seemingly negative perception of the American police officers by some, even though we have taken an oath of public office to serve and protect while valuing the constitutional rights of everyone. It should be noted that it was President Calvin Coolidge who once said, quote, no one is compelled to choose the profession of police officer, but having chosen it, everyone is obliged to live up to the standard of its requirements, end quote. When I started my law enforcement career, we did not have to learn about things like synthetic drugs or administering Narcan, uh, terrorism or WMD, human trafficking, social media crime, and the demands of managing digital evidence, officer wellness, wearing of body armor, having a camera on our uniform, or having a utility belt with a conductive energy device and a weapon that was semi-automatic. But in just this past year or so, there are even more issues we need to train for, and we have made such great strides in the revamping of the basic course for police and peace officers, and to name an area where the instructional objectives like implicit and racial bias are now there, cultural diversity, persons with disabilities, procedural and restorative justice, use of force, no chokeholds, de-escalation techniques, raising the age issues, bail, speedy trial and discovery, reforms, expanded civil rights, crisis intervention, mental health and disabilities, videotaping, custodial interrogations, and facial recognition, just to name some. Why all these additions to our basic training curriculum? 
because these are the times we are living in, that our new police officers must be able to do more than operate a smartphone with their hands to meet the challenges conserving the peace and appropriately interacting with others. When our police academies across the state have their culmination graduations, the new officers are basically ready to face the challenges of modern law enforcement and the rigors of the job, having experienced well over the minimum number of hours we required, and in most cases, averaging well over a thousand hours of basic training, classroom, physical fitness, defensive tactics, the firearms range, EVOC, and an extended use of scenario and reality-based training, which has made a huge difference. I could speak for this council when I say they are disciplined and well-educated in the laws and procedures, even though those laws continue to expand. They understand the synergy of teamwork and most importantly, the solid ethical awareness required to be a public servant with public trust. So I want to just say two words. Thank you. Thank you to the DCJS Office of Public Safety staff and all of our special committees, associations, the NYSP and the NYPD for everyone's work to constantly improve police and police officer training in New York State. Okay, that ends my uh, my opening remarks. I thank you for the opportunity to have said that. Um, I note we have the four council members present. That's good. I also note that uh, for the record, we are still missing uh, an appointment of, a, of another sheriff, an appointment of another chief of police, and uh, our request to have the state police superintendent appointment. Uh, currently, with the recent retirement of the uh, NYPD Chief Chartel, we uh, have yet another vacancy on the council. The council, by law, may have up to eight members. We currently uh, have four. I thank DCJS and OPS staff uh, present, as well as the guests all involved today. And the agenda is before us. And I would seek a motion from uh, one of the council members for its adoption or its correction. So move. All right, there's a motion from Chief Parisi. Do I hear a second? Second, Bruce McBride. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we have a, a motion and a second to uh, adopt the, uh, the agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, aye. Uh, anyone opposed? All right, hearing no opposition, the agenda is adopted. Uh, members were, prison, were previously sent uh, the June 3rd, 250th minutes, and I would seek a motion for its adoption or correction. I would ask one of the council members to uh, to move for the adoption of the 250th minutes. Um, Sheriff, this is Bruce. Um, I don't have them. Um, they weren't in the materials. Maybe I missed it. I'm sorry. Okay, um, I did. Uh, I did review them. Um, I I will make that motion myself. Uh, can I have a second, please? I'll second. Second. <laughs> Okay, a second from uh, uh, Dr. Clofus. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Sheriff. Opposed? Yes, uh, yes. Sorry, Sheriff, this is Johanna. I'm just going to ask, I think, for, for this and for others, like we've done, did the last time, would it be possible, and Natasha, correct me if I'm wrong, for us to do a roll call? of each individual so we have an accurate record. Um, so if we can go through each one and ask their names, uh, those that are voting. Thank you, Johanna. I was trying to <laughs> call in or unmute myself. Yes, because unfortunately I can't hear if everyone's saying I or I, and people okay. and can't see. Okay, I understand. I was uh, just taking the position that if we didn't hear any opposition, then I would assume that uh, everyone approved. Uh, we we can do a, we can do a roll call on that. Uh, well, let's go back then uh, on the uh, on the adoption of the agenda. Uh, 
uh, Commissioner McBride. I'll have to abstain uh, on that one. So. Uh, uh, Chief Parisi. Yes. Dr. Clofus. Aye. On the adoption of the agenda before us, Dr. Clofus. Aye. Okay, thank you. And uh, I, I also uh, uh, say I agree. All right, that, uh, that agenda is adopted. Uh, on the um, adoption of the uh, 250th uh, minutes meeting, uh, we did have a motion in the second. Uh, uh, Commissioner McBride, uh, how do you vote on that? Yes. Okay, Chief Parisi? Yes. Uh, Dr. Clofus? Yes. And uh, yes for myself. So the the adoption of the 250 minutes, 50th meeting minutes is adopted. Okay, uh, we will uh, move into action items now. And uh, I would ask uh, council members that when you do make a motion that you do read the motion aloud as uh, noted in our action item descriptions that uh, was sent out to everyone. Um, and uh, so we can uh, we'll move forward with that, okay? Um, the first presenter is um, on the use of force model policy uh, for updating. Uh, Michael Puckett, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Sheriff. Just a second that you can hear me. Yes, sir. Okay, thanks, sir. Uh, I, just on behalf of the staff, you suggest to, given your, your comments there, uh, we do appreciate the work that you and the members of the council do in facilitating our work uh, at OPS. Uh, we did take a look at the use of force model policy. Uh, there's some recent legislative changes uh, that necessitated us to take yet another look at the model policy. Um, specifically, those changes uh, that were addressed here were the creation of the crime of aggra aggravated strangulation uh, within the penal law. Uh, specifically applies to police and peace officers who use certain uh, neck restraints or obstruct a person's breathing. Uh, the, the new section of Executive Law 837V, which requires a law enforcement officer to make a verbal and then written report of any firearms discharge within a certain amount of time for each report. And also Civil Rights Law uh, Section 28, which creates a cause of action uh, for a police officer who uh, fails to provide medical care or care of the mental health of a person uh, within their custody. Um, so just moving through, you'll see the changes that we made uh, in response to that legislation. On page four, and these changes are going to be in red. Uh, you'll see the chokeholds and obstruction of breathing or blood circulation section. Uh, essentially here, we, we just prohibited their use absent authorization for deadly physical force. So any chokehold, any neck restraint, any uh, technique that could obstruct the breathing or uh, blood circulation of a person, uh, we prohibited those absent the, the necessary justification for deadly force. And you'll see a citation there to the, the strangulation law, the new law, aggravated strangulation 12113A on the bottom. Moving on to page five, again in red, uh, for reporting and reviewing the use of force, uh, addressing the civil rights law, Section 28, uh, requiring that uh, good faith efforts are provided to uh, respond to the medical needs or mental health needs of a person in custody, uh, and then giving some parameters there, trying to give some guidance to police officers in terms of what, what does that mean, uh, settling upon the well-established reasonable cause to believe or probable cause standard that police officers are used to dealing with in uh, mental health 941 type situations. Again, footnoting the civil rights law and then the mental hygiene law uh, for, that, for that standard there on the bottom of page five. And lastly, on page six, referencing executive law 837V, the requirement that officers, uh, I'm sorry, uh, on page six, the requirement that officers document those requests, right, for, uh, for the, the needs, uh, any, any care that they sought for the needs of the person. And then again, 837V requirement that officers, uh, and this just noted a footnote here, 
Uh, we already had within our policy uh, requirement that officers document firearms discharges. And here we just footnoted the law, uh, adding that there's now an executive law section requiring the same. Be happy to answer any questions anybody might have about the changes or the process. Uh, I think, Mr. McBride, I believe that you're still on mute. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes okay. Um, could you uh, simply just uh, give a very brief review of how uh, the process was conducted to update the policy? Oh, yes, sir. That, uh, my mistake. Uh, we did, we did re-involve the panel members uh, of the initial policy and the previous review. Uh, those those uh, stakeholders include the New York State Association of Chiefs of Police, representatives from New York State Sheriff's Association, DASME, the New York City Police Department, the New York State Police, the New York State Docs, and the law enforcement training directors of New York State. Um, so we sought input from the panel members that were previously assigned to this project and uh, revisited the same with them because they understood kind of the the, uh, the process by which we came to the policy where we have now. Thank you very much. Yes, I have one question yes. for you. Can you hear me? Um, you know, I, I, I just, uh, I know the FBI is trying to collect uh, use of force data from police departments. It's a voluntary thing, just like the UCR is, but does ECGS have a, a position on that? If, if I, uh, Mike, do you have that? Do you want to take that or do you want me to address it? No, go ahead, John. We're, we're generally trying to conform with federal reporting guidelines um, is, is the point. Obviously, that's a voluntary program, but even within the use of force reporting definitions, you'll note that we use the federal definition for serious uh, personal injury. So, yeah, we're, we're trying to conform to that um, as much as we possibly can and at, at the same time uh, adhere to New York State law. Did I miss anything, Johanna? No, that's it. That's exactly right. The, the new New York State law, as Mike indicated, does in, in we did put it in uh, the requirements there that do comport with the federal requirement. It's And it's a voluntary process, as Mike indicated, but our New York State law does have that federal those federal definitions in there. Yeah. Is, is, is that referenced in in the use of in the model policy anywhere? Yes, it is. Um, I just trying to pull up the page. I'm not sure of the page offhand, but I know we referenced it uh, when those went into effect last year. Okay, thank you. This is that's, this is Josh Finell. John, it's on page six. Thanks, Josh. Okay. Thank you. No other questions, from If there are no further questions, uh, Chair Spike, I'd like the, the council to consider a motion to uh, adopt the uh, amended use of force model policy to replace the current one. Uh, if Chief Reese would want to make that motion, is he uh, still on? I think, uh, Natasha, uh, you, you want us to uh, read that uh, motion verbally, don't you? Oh, that's right. I, I apologize. A motion to the amended use of force policy to replace the current MPTC use of force policy. Model policy. All right. Uh, do we have a second? A second, Bruce McBride. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, we have a, a motion and a second. Any further discussion on the uh, 
motion to uh, replace the current use of force model policy. All right, hearing none, uh, we'll poll the vote. Uh, Commissioner McBride? Yes. Chief Parisi? Yes. Dr. Clofus? Yes. And myself is a yes. Uh, that uh, the motion uh, is, uh, is approved. And uh, thank you, Michael, for your presentation. The, uh, the next item uh, for action is uh, the uh, defensive tactics uh, curriculum updates. Uh, uh, Daniel Nedwell will present. Go ahead, Dan. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Just to confirm, you can hear me all right? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. As uh, Mike alluded to in the, the model policy update there, the recent reforms created the new penal law section of the crime of aggravated strangulation. The, the really important part of this new law is that they're now referencing the instruction of blood blood circulation when it comes to this new penal law section. And the basic course for police officers DT section, along with the DT instructor course, we currently have sections that do instruct on vascular restraints. We, we have used a technique called a shoulder pin restraint, which is a type of vascular restraint, but it does obstruct blood flow. And therefore, if an officer did cause serious injury or death, they could be charged under this new law. After consulting with our panel of subject matter experts, these are the, the instructors from around the state who really have developed this course and continue to teach it throughout the state. Uh, we decided to re, it would be best moving forward to remove the sections on vascular restraint from the basic course for police officers, along with the MPTC BT instructor course. So in the basic course for police officers, section 4J, uh, we are going to be asking for removal of the instructional, the instruction, objectional learning of the learning objective, excuse me, number 21, which would be the practical demonstration of the shoulder pin restraint, along with the discontinuation of the optional instruction on neck restraint located on pages 26 and 29 in 4J. Uh, just as a side note, these sections in the basic course were previously optional for the local academies. There are a lot of academies that weren't comfortable teaching techniques. So when this curriculum was developed, this whole, both the learning objective and the section on neck restraints were both optional at that time. But now we're asking for the removal of those sections. As for the defensive tactics instructor course, we're asking for the removal of learning objective number 26 in section eight on defensive control techniques. Once again, that would be a practical demonstration of the shoulder pin restraint. And then also the removal of the instructions on two sections in section eight of defensive control techniques. The first section, we utilize the shoulder pin restraint as a takedown, so it is found in the takedown portions of the manual, and then also in the neck restraints portion of the manual. Uh, this shoulder pin restraint uh, is used as both a takedown or also as an extraction technique. We've taught it either in vehicles or cells in the past. But uh, at this time, after consulting with everyone involved, we feel moving forward, it's best to remove those techniques at this time. If anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them on this topic. Uh, Dan, are we uh, are we leaving any uh, options to any of the academies uh, at all? No, it, it used to be optional under the basic course, but we're, at this point we're going to remove it. The, the feel when we spoke with the instructors around the state and the guys who the, the officers who developed this curriculum is that the, the lack of DT training that a lot of these officers get upon graduation from the academy, that these types of techniques now with the added possible risk of being charged under this new law, the, the, the risk just kind of doesn't reweigh the reward of the techniques. Okay, yeah, thank you. Because this was all in response to uh, new legislation, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, any uh, council members have any uh, questions of uh, Daniel? All right. Um, any uh, any further discussion? Um, hearing none. Um, would uh, Dr. Clovis, do you want to uh, go ahead and, um, and and do the motions on this? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, motion number one: uh, remove learning objective number twenty-one and the neck restraint section located on pages four J point twenty-six 
to 4J.29 of the basic course for police officers defensive ta tactics and principles of control curriculum. Okay, uh, we'll, uh, let's, uh, let, let's do the, we'll do that motion uh, uh, and vote on that, then we'll vote on the second uh, motion. Uh, okay, there's a, we have a motion, do I have a second? Second, Mr. Craig. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion on motion one? All right, uh, Dr. McBride, how do you vote? Yes. Okay, uh, Chief Parisi? Yes. Uh, and Dr. Clofus? Uh, yes. Okay, and, and myself is a yes. All right, uh, that uh, motion one passes. Uh, let's go to motion two, uh, Doctor. Okay, motion two. Remove learning objective number 26 in section B, defensive control techniques of the Municipal Police Training Council defensive tactics and structure course, along with section uh, 12, uh, Roman numeral 12, subsection one, shoulder pin restraint and section uh, Roman numeral 18, neck restraints located within section eight of the curriculum. Okay, thank you. Uh, do I have a question? Second, Mr. Brun. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Any further discussion on the motion? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll vote. Uh, Commissioner McBride? Yes. Chief Parisi? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Clofus? Yes. And myself is a yes. Uh, motion two does uh, does pass. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Clofus. And uh, thank you, Daniel, for your uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. All right, the, uh, the next item uh, is uh, hate crimes investigations model policy. And our uh, presenter is uh, Bert Boucher. Uh, Bert, go ahead. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Excellent. Again, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Uh, my previous colleagues, my presentation results from recent police reform legislation. Just a quick reminder, uh, this current policy was passed in December of 2020. Uh, the panel consisting of New York State Police, New York State Association Chiefs of Police, New York State Sheriff's Association, the NYPD, Led Danny's, New York State Division of Human Rights, and the Anti-Defamation League. So included in the reform package that was recently passed was the change to New York State Civil Rights Law, 79N. And the new law makes it a civil rights violation to call 911 to report a non-emergency incident involving a member of a protected class without reason to suspect a crime or imminent threat. So it, it's prohibited race-based 911 calls. So while this is a civil issue, we had addressed something similar in the model policy when we passed it in December. So taking into consideration that these 911 calls are going to generate a police response, we wanted to ensure that we gave some guidance in the policy for officers and agencies that are going to handle these types of calls. So previously, we had spoken with the New York State Division of Human Rights and referred to them in the policy, and they were able to to act as a referral agency for particular um, non-criminal incidents that the police may come in contact with. So we basically just expanded that. So on on page seven of the policy under section five, you'll see in red letters um, after letter F here, it's in cases where a police or peace officer is summoned for suspected criminal activity based on the belief or perception about the individual's race, color, national origin, ancestry, gender, religion, religious practice, age, disability, or sexual orientation, and a reasonable person would not suspect such a violation, the supervisor should provide the victim with referral information the New York State Division of Human Rights. For other civil matters where discrimination is alleged in individual in areas such as employment, housing, credit, places of public accommodation, DHR is also uh, able to help those folks out. So that was the thought process here was just to offer some guidance. We know that officers are going to run into these types of situations. 
and we wanted to give them the tools to be able to handle that. Does anybody have any questions? Anyone have any discussions uh, dis uh, with uh, questions for Daniel? No. Okay, uh, thank you. Hearing okay. none, uh, uh, Commissioner McBride, uh, would you want to uh, make this motion? So moved, um, I'll read it. Uh, uh, Commissioner Bride, do you want me to read that uh, motion uh, for you? Would that be helpful? No, I can read it. Um, I was just uh, okay. I, I was just waiting for um, uh, there was a break in the in the uh, okay. sound. Okay. Uh, the motion is to adopt the amended investigations of hate crime model policy to replace the current MPTC investigations of hate crimes model policy. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Second, Dr. Klokas, thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll pull the motion. Uh, Commissioner McBride. Thank you, Chief Parisi. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Klokas. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, and uh, myself is also a yes. Uh, so that motion uh, on uh, the hate crimes model policy does pass. And uh, uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Bert, for your presentation. Uh, you're welcome. Thank, you. thank you. All right, uh, moving on the agenda, the next item is the uh, DOCS uh, Peace Officer uh, uh, Training. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would uh, note for the record that uh, I did receive a recent letter from uh, the uh, DOCS uh, uh, Director of Training regarding this issue, and uh, Josh Feinhardt, Feinhardt will, uh, will fill us all in. Uh, go ahead, Josh. Thank you, Chairman. And again, um, good morning to the members of the Council and those in attendance. Um, I'll be presenting on behalf of the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. Um, as Chairman just mentioned, um, that letter has been forwarded also to all the council members <clears throat> and, and representatives uh, that are in attendance today, which was submitted by DOCS and is essentially the substance of this action item, which um, I'll briefly summarize. Um, to recap from last meeting in June, um, this action item was tabled at the June meeting at the request of the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision uh, to allow them more time to evaluate their curricula against the MPTC's current training standards. Um, this additional time uh, allowed for docs to determine if they could, if they would uh, pursue a continued exemption for the MPTC prescribed courses for their new parole and correction officers. So to, to give you some, some historical knowledge and, without uh, belaboring the point, um, in June 2011, the MPTC granted exemptions to DOCS for their basic parole officer course and their uh, basic correction officer course. Um, Executive Law 841H um, allows for DOCS to be exempt from the requirements of the Criminal Procedure Law 2.30 which requires peace officers to complete the MPTC prescribed training programs. So pursuant to the exemption allowance in Executive Law 840, it was determined by the council that the DOCS basic training, this was determined by the council back in 2011, that the DOCS basic training for their parole and correction officers exceeded the topics and our requirements of the minimum standards established for these peace officer designations. It was further determined by the council at that time that supplanting DOCS current training program with the MPTC prescribed courses would have been a reduction in their, in their uh, standards established. So under Executive Law 840, um, that exemption request was granted um, to um, DOCS for their training of their new uh, parole officers and correction officers. Now, as we all know, since 2011, the council has significantly enhanced the basic course for peace officers minimum training standards to include contemporary law enforcement issues, 
which resulted in an increase um, of the basic course for peace officers from 99 hours and now currently stands at 162 hours. So similarly, um, the council also updated the basic course for correction officers with new use of force component, um, revised defensive tactics, um, and aerosol subject restraint standards, which will be effective January 1st, 2021. So upon review of the revised curricula, it was determined by docs that the enhancements to both curriculums, the basic course for peace officers and the basic course for correction officers for the training of the parole officers and correction officers was, is appropriate. So therefore docs will utilize each of the curriculums in lieu of requesting further exemptions. Now, it's important to note um, this request is being made um, on a starting date of beginning on January 1st, 2021. DOCS has requested that that be the effective date for this request where they will begin utilizing the basic course for peace officers to train the new parole officers. And for the correction officers, they'll utilize the basic course for, for correction officers. Um, DOCS will also submit to the Office of Public Safety um, prior to conducting the courses, approval to run these courses so that way staff can ensure that the correct training hours, topics, and um, certified instructors are being utilized when conducting these MPTC minimum standard training courses. And if you were to look at uh, Criminal Procedure Law Section 2.30, Subdivision 1, um, there's also a, a note in that particular statute that says any doc specific training for parole officers and correction officers are to, is to be conducted in addition to the training curriculum minimum standards for peace officers established by the council. So um, the, to no longer, uh, just to kind of summarize it all, um, the New York State docs is no longer requesting exemptions for, from the basic course for peace and from the basic course uh, for correction officers, they will conduct uh, training using those minimum standards established by the council. In addition to that, they will conduct any employer specific training that goes beyond the minimum standards for their parole officers and or correction officers. Um, the next slide um, is the motion. Um, it's a lengthy motion, but it, it summarizes what I've said now and it also summarizes the process where they will be submitting for approval to us the minimum topics and hours for these courses and also a note in there that any specific training to parole officers and correction officers will be conducted in addition to the minimum standards for the peace officers established for these two designations. Um, you all should have received that letter too. Um, that letter um, also summarizes basically what I just explained, uh, but I uh, am you know, uh, to that end, um, I'm available here for any questions um, that you may have regarding this, uh, this motion request. Okay, thank you, uh, Josh. Uh, does anyone have any questions of, uh, of uh, Josh? No. Okay, uh, uh, hearing none. Uh, Okay, uh, hearing none, uh, let me make this motion then. Uh, motion is to remove the exemptions from the basic course for peace officers and basic course for correction officers and require the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision beginning January 1, 2021 to use the basic course for peace officers to train new parole officers and use the basic course for correction officers to train new correction officers. All curriculum submitted for approval must contain the minimum topics and hours for these courses. Any docs specific training for parole officers and correction officers will be conducted in addition to the training curriculum minimum standards for peace officers established by, this, by the council. Uh, do I hear a second? No. Uh, I, w I think it was Chief Parisi that uh, did second that. Uh, thank you. And um, uh, any further discussion? All right, let's proceed to vote. Uh, Commissioner McBride. Uh, 
Uh, Commissioner McBride. Yes. Commissioner McBride. Yes. Okay, Chief Parisi. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Clofus. Yes. Okay, and myself is a yes. So uh, that uh, that motion uh, on action item five does pass. Uh, thank you, uh, Josh, for your uh, for your presentation. Okay, moving into the informational uh, items and update uh, issues, uh, the use of force reporting definitions. Um, I believe uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Mike Wood will uh, talk on this. Mike. Yeah, good morning, Sheriff and uh, members of the council and everybody out there in the virtual world on our second remote meeting. So far, so good. Um, first of all, before I go into the, use, the definition issue here, I just uh, again like to echo and thank you for your opening remarks, Sheriff. Um, appreciate it and all the amount of work that's gone in over the years um, in improving uh, training and such. So, uh, again, your comments are um, very much appreciated. Thank you. And thanks to the council for the support. Um, also couldn't do it without the support of our commissioner who's not on the line today. As you notice, he was fully expecting to be here, but had a uh, slight mishap and uh, is having a surgical procedure this morning. So um, everything will be okay, but uh, he, he uh, had an opportunity to get in and get taken care of this morning. So uh, he expresses his regrets. And uh, frankly, I think uh, if he had the choice between the two, he'd definitely be here. So yeah. with that, um, so I just, uh, you obviously you have a, a sheet in your packet that provides a little bit of an overview. I just want to provide a little bit of a chronology, if I could, um, just to kind of reacquaint everybody with the issue um, as we see it. And I'll do a little bit of uh, editorializing, I think, as I go through this, but um, to explain where we are and, and where we're going at this particular point with these use of force definitions. So uh, in last year's budget, um, as you know, E37T was passed in the executive law and the reporting standard for um, use of force reporting started effective July of 2019. So we're just over a year of reporting now statewide by law enforcement. Uh, upon initial passage of the statute, there was widespread confusion um, with the law across the, uh, across the state. Uh, the interpretation of language, again, most particularly the use of the word brandish and combining with other terms, where in, in another section of it, they specifically use the word point. So there were some questions regarding legislative intent and a lot of confusion. I know I can speak to myself personally, the number of calls I received, uh, chiefs associations, both local, statewide, sheriffs, you name it. Um, there was a lot of discussion on this. There were significant concerns regarding consistency of reporting. Um, across these definitions and just trying to adhere to the to the statute and what the intent was. So, as you recall, um, as a result of that, we had uh, subsequent uh, discussions internally and with the council um, that was brought before you in December of 19 to define some of the uh, to provide additional definition to some statutory language in an effort again with a positive intention to ensure consistency of reporting which we were very concerned about. Um, this is a DCGS rule, just as a finer point. Um, but again, as all these things, as we put together subject matter expert panels and go through these processes over time, uh, we try to involve everybody uh, to get all points and feedback to put the best possible product forward. So as a result of that and that, that work product in December, the MPTC was presented with the definitions that are in their current form uh, right now under, I think, still under emergency regulation. And the uh, council did endorse those definitions at that point. So during that time period, with uh, emergency regulations in place and the new definitions, it goes to a 45-day uh, uh, public comment period. We did receive uh, feedback from the legislature, specifically the assembly, uh, in writing. Uh, they brought up a number of issues that came up, but the one in particular is the one that we felt necessary to address was this issue of pointing a firearm because their insistence that the legislative intent was to capture those as a reportable use of force. Um, I really can't speak to why it wasn't said in plain language in the statute, 
Um, we did not get into any negotiations thereafter um, at the point while everything was, was going on. Um, but I think collectively everyone understood that, that issue. I would also add that I think in my opener, I talked about a year's worth of reporting. And I think this is an, another important um, distinction and note. You may recall that uh, part of that definitional process um, in the guidance was that the mere pointing of a firearm in the current definitions and the frequently asked questions was not a reportable incident. So that's an, obviously in conflict what what we're told the legislative intent was, number one. And number two, from a data perspective, although the data is not finalized, has not been released, and, and you know, we, we're not really, we can't release anything at this point, uh, but I can tell you that the preliminary reporting has shown very clearly that um, the numbers being reported are consistent with displaying, pointing that type of action with a firearm and not the actual use um, in the current definition. And you, you see in your packet the, um, you know, the, the new definition. I think the old definition, as I have it in front of me, indicated brandish uses discharge of the firearm all in one category that was the operation of a firearm against a person in a manner capable of causing physical injury now generally speaking that would be the you know the firing of a, a firearm although there could be lesser circumstances where a firearm could be used or different um, but the point is that the numbers have not changed so it's quite clear that law enforcement across the state is report still reporting under the 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 pointing um, of a firearm. And I could just tell you my, from my personal side of it and some of the chiefs that I talked to around the state, you know, they were kind of taken aback in the beginning because many of those do report them internally, a pointing of a firearm as a use of force. Some places didn't. So uh, some departments had to turn around and say, well, it's an internal report, but not a external report to the state. And, and again, the confusion is um, quite obvious. So with that, um, I would, I, I would say that you're now, um, presented today with amended use of force definitions that we intend to um, add and again, renew and add to emergency regulations to clarify this issue, to support the legislative intent, um, clear up um, with a little bit more plain language on this issue and in other similar categories within the statute uh, when it comes to electronic control weapons um, and impact weapons as well. Um, to, to add the point, the plain language of pointing. Now, you know, I would also admit, again, th this is not going to fix everything. I think we all have to acknowledge that. The statute still has its limitations. Um, we're, we're still trying to do our best to ensure consistent reporting across the board. So you have the definitions in your packet. Um, I definitely, you know, would like to um, open it up to discussion here. Uh, one last point before I do that, I would just say that the agency and the state office of uh, information technology is in the process of finalizing the permanent reporting tool that will be done through the IJ portal. That's expected to be completed in the fall. And uh, I, I think an important note in there for the conference that when these definitions are put in the portal for reporting purposes for law enforcement, the word brandish doesn't have, it, it's, it's in the statute, but the, the definitions as you see them, as far as to point of arm, to point, that's what will be seen in the reporting tool. Um, all of this, again, is to try to limit confusion and to ensure consistency of reporting. So that's my my overview. I would certainly open it up to uh, questions, concerns, and we do have um, folks on the phone and on the line here that were involved in the panel process um, all the way throughout. That can come. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you, uh, Michael. Does any council member have any, uh, any uh, concerns or questions for uh, Michael? Um, Bruce McBride, is there a timetable for the uh, the use of the new uh, definitions and for the, um, I would say, the amended report or the new reporting? So I, I think um, I'm going to ask Natasha to comment on the regulatory process, if I could, Bruce, but um, I would also say that some of this plays into the reporting tool issue as well um, and can okay. as far as on an annual basis. So there's a number of factors we don't, I can't say exactly when it's going to place, but I think it is a good opportunity for Natasha to talk about where we go from here. If you could, Natasha. Sure. 
Uh, right now, regs are still um, in place, but once we're ready to go, I believe we want an effective date of either either November or December of this year, I believe. Um, so once we're ready to go, I will submit the new emergency regs, the definitions um, to the Department of State, which will be effective as soon as I file them. So whatever date that is. At the same time, since we are also amending the definitions, they will also go through another public comment period, which is 45 days. Um, so depending on that, um, we'll see if our new definitions, you know, meet to, meets the approval of the assembly. Um, so we received no comments back. We can go ahead and finalize these definite I mean, the regulations for once, because we've been adopting them repeatedly since last year of July. So hopefully, once everything is okay, we can finalize these, and then they'll be good to go. Uh, uh, okay, thanks, Natasha. Do you require a uh, uh, an adoption by the uh, by the council or 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 not? No, these are. Oh, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> no, no, go go, go right ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say these are DCJS rules, um, so there's no requirement from the MPTC um, to you know make a motion or vote on these at all. I would just add, Sheriff, that uh, you know the last time we came in front of this body. Um, you know, the council elected to, um, you know, take it up as an action item and do an official endorsement. So I'll, I'll leave that up to your consideration if you uh, would like to do that again. Yeah, I, I know that the, uh, there was no real guidance uh, from the legislation and obviously you, you want to follow the legislative intent uh, as far as the definitions go. And so I know that uh, DCJS and, and the committees that you had uh, did the best they could to uh, define brandish, which was of great concern. And again, brandish at that time uh, was analogous with use and deploy, but uh, uh, now we've separated it out. I just want to, uh, you're, you're going to make sure that the reporting tool has a separation as well? Yes, absolutely. It's already being worked on. Okay. All right. Yeah, and if I could just reiterate what Mike had said, just to on the brandish issue and the concerns regarding that, the reporting tool, the, the regs will use the term uh, defining and clarifying brandish as to point in the different pieces of it, but the actual reporting tool for clarity will just point and not utilize the, the confusing term of brandish. Okay. All right. Uh, that make, makes sense. Okay. Um, any other uh, questions or concerns? Okay, uh, hearing none, um, we um, the next meeting of the council is uh, first part of December, and uh, you will have already put these out by then. Do you think, uh, Natasha? I'm gonna try to get these over to chamber for their review sometime this month, early October. Okay, all right. Would would it be desirous uh, for the council to take action on the support of your definitions, or we'll just leave it leave it alone? What do you What do you think, uh, Michael or Natasha? Yeah, I think I, I think uh, again speaking for Commissioner Green and what we did before. Um, you know, I think that would be uh, appreciated for your consideration, Mr. Chairman. Well, we certainly want to meet the legislative intent, uh, uh, that's for sure. And uh, the clarification, uh, as these were emergency regs in the first place. Uh, does any other <laughs> council members have any uh, commentary on this, or do we need to talk to our associations, or are we uh, okay to maybe move something? I, I just would like to make sure that the um, for the process that everyone knows that the revised use of force um, these definitions were shared with the same panel that assisted us. Just so that you all know that uh, the panel that assisted us in the first place in coming up with these have also received these revised ones. Just just for your informational purposes. Uh, okay, I, I I was just going to ask that. So thank thank you, Joanna. Uh, Chief Parisi, any uh, comments? 
Well, Chairman, I would just reiterate a lot of what has been said by most of the uh, DCJS staff that we're, we're you know, the legislation is put this direction. So if that is their intent, we certainly should be um, assisting law enforcement in, in guidance. So if the, that is the intent, we obviously have to move in the direction that the legislation has us going. So um, whether we, <laughs> whether it's, uh, so we really don't have a, a choice kind of, so that we need to get the uh, message out to the law enforcement. So I think it, it wouldn't be a, a bad thing to do that. All right, thank you, Chief. Uh, Commissioner McBride. Um, as uh, Chief said, I think it would be a reaffirmation of, uh, of the legislative intent and we should go forward. Okay, that's your focus. Dr. Kovas, any comment? I guess uh, having some trouble with his. Uh... Can, you, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Tom. Yes, I have. I have no comments or questions. Are you looking for a motion? Uh, sure. Well, I, I think I might. I want to. I want to hear uh, 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 Colonel Red, Renneman. Uh, any any commentary? Uh, do you have any anything you could help the council with over this? No, I wouldn't have. Any, I, I I have no input on that uh, issue right now. Okay. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, 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 Tim Bodet, NYPD. Any, any, any comments? Um, uh, no comments. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. All right. Uh, I think uh, I think it might be uh, uh, in order for. Uh, let, me, let me make a motion that uh, we support the uh, uh, DCJS's uh, efforts here to. Uh, uh, redefine the uh, use of force reporting definitions uh, going forward. Um, I would make that uh, motion uh, and uh, seek a second. Second. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. Uh, let's uh, let's vote on that. Um, as there's no further discussion, uh, Commissioner McBride. Yes. Chief Parisi. Yes. Yes. Dr. Clopas. Yes. Okay, and myself is a yes. Uh, that motion passes uh, to support these uh, redefinitions uh, to be in line with the legislative intent. So, thank you all, uh, and thank you, Michael. Um, let's move on to the police and community collaboration guidance, uh, Michael. Uh, again, yeah. So, just uh, in spite of the how how this is worded on here, I just want to um, kind of level set here, I guess, and going into this discussion. Um, you know, our intention of putting this on the uh, agenda today was in response to Bruce's comments at the last meeting about, as you recall, a lot of this stuff was bubbling up with the, you know, police reform and a lot of a lot of stuff going on around the country. Uh, continues obviously so um, you know we, we kind of put it off for for another day as we are wait, awaiting you know guidance um, after the executive order and so on and so forth and I would just say sheriff that um, what we prepared today you probably did 90 percent of in your opening remarks um, is what I would say so um, as you know the the guidance document was was um, issued recently um, and you know, from the DCGS perspective, our contributions were, as you know, you stated, and we have folks that could go into and I'm going to actually hand this over to Johanna in a minute, uh, because we did provide an outline just very br briefly of the areas that that I think we bring to the table at DCGS with the experience, the both, um, you know, recruit level training programs through the MPTC and service level training um, and more. 
So I, I think we, we contribute in a lot of ways, but our, our role in this is going to be to just deliver training to provide opportunity for folks in what we see as critical areas. And many of those, uh, again, they're not under uh, development now. They've been uh, developed, worked on, and continue to be deployed over the last several years. So I guess that would be my, um, my opening remarks on this. Um, I would like to turn it over, I think, to Johanna and any other staff that she has just briefly at a high level to go over just an outline of the things that we've prepared that would help police departments um, yeah. statewide, we believe, in dealing with the number of the issues presented in the um, Reimagining Police Guidance document. Johanna? Yep. Uh, first, I just want to echo what everyone said, and thank you very much, uh, Sheriff uh, Spike, for your uh, kind words in the beginning and thoughtful, as always, reflection on the work of this council. And thanks to the council for the support of the office and the agency in leading some of the initiatives. I think Mike did definitely uh, said it right. You addressed a lot of the things that we've already been doing. Um, but we wanted to share in response to all of that, some of the other things that you may not know, and just uh, as a little reminder, again, at a high level. In addition to some of the work that's been going on at the MPTC here, the Office of Public Safety has been involved in an initiative called the Gun Involved Violence Elimination Initiative. Basically, it funds the 17 jurisdictions outside of New York City, um, and the funding is to focus on evidence-based work uh, to reduce homicides and shootings. And in, as part of that uh, initiative, the uh, we have done a lot of training on principal policing, which now, now or procedural justice, which now we're calling principal policing. And so that has been going on for about six years now through that initiative, some of which uh, was helpful um, in including the procedural justice uh, components of the basic course. So right now, what we have been doing is um, continuing to ramp up that in light of the EO. And now it's a principle, we've converted it to a term called principle policing instead of procedural justice, the same components, same theories. There are three pieces to it. Pr principle policing one uh, is one course, two is another course, and then three, which will be launched in October, is uh, based upon a lot of the implicit bias concepts. So those courses were being offered right now. We've, we've been offering them for a while, but we've revamped that and we're being offering them around the uh, state uh, for people to do. And they're trained the trainer so that at the local level, people can do that. So that is one uh, component that we're working on through the GIVE initiative. Another component is we've been doing a webinar series that we'll be continuing to do on a variety of different issues uh, that are uh, reflective in the GIVE initiative from uh, SEPTED, which is a crime prevention through environmental design to procedural justice and other initiatives. And that will be going on again throughout the year that people can find out about. Uh, we have, uh, we also are anticipating and hoping to present to this council uh, for consideration the principal policing training that I was just talking to you about uh, to make it an MPTC course for standardization the way this council has led in so many ways on other curriculum. We're hoping to present that to all of you for consideration at the December meeting. And so we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, in addition, we're in some early phases of trying to look at ways in which we can have support um, conversations between community members and police and give guidance to local law enforcement as to how they can do that. So we've been doing some uh, on conversations at our level with our uh, snug workers um, and also with our principal policing instructors and looking to see what we can learn from that to help um, help other uh, locals do that. So that's another area that we've been working on. Um, as many of you know, in addition to this council, we have the accreditation uh, council, which sets forth a variety of standards. Many of them talk about policies of along some of the issues that are discussed um, in that guidance document. So all of those are available uh, to any agency, whether you are an accredited agency or not, and any agency that wants to become accredited, we have all the information as to how to do that on our website as to how to become accredited and staff that can help with that. Um, Obviously, if at any point anybody wants to ask a question on any of these, please chime in and I'll be happy to do that. I'm trying to keep it high level because there is a lot of work that has been going on um, uh, on these issues. Uh, we have obviously, as you all know, many MPTC model policies that address a lot of the issues in the guidance document. And so that is, um, those are available to all law enforcement ranging from you know, body worn camera, facial recognition uh, to force and others. So those are available to law enforcement to assist them. 
In addition, we have the decertification process, which this council uh, led that, which uh, is an effort to try to address uh, officers that are uh, re terminated, removed, or resigned due to misconduct or incompetence. And that's been an ongoing process that the agency has been implementing uh, to require departments to report to us when somebody has been removed for incompetence or misconduct. That information then gets relayed. Uh, the person will then have to redo their basic course training. Uh, and one of the goals for that, obviously, is they are no longer as um, enticing or uh, to another department. So that has been something that's been going on since 2016 when this council did that, did those efforts. Um, in addition, there are all of the variety of instructor courses that uh, the agency has been um, leading and online courses. And I think at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Josh to talk a little bit about all the various um, continuing education opportunities that are out there for law enforcement that have been built upon the infrastructure of the MPTC uh, work that has been done. Thanks, Johanna. Um, just at, at a very high level, um, obviously, um, in, in the chairman, you, you mentioned early on in your opening remarks, um, um, the MPTC has done an incredible amount of work um, in collaboration with DCGS staff um, to completely revamp how we train recruits. But um, part of that re revamping of the uh, training curriculum for recruits also requires a component to train instructors to deliver that material. And what we have found is as we trained instructors to deliver the recruit material, uh, we were simultaneously training them to also deliver training at the in-service level as well. Uh, many of the issues overlap in uh, post-academy at an in-service level. So we developed a, a significant number of courses and delivered them uh, over the past couple of years um, all over the state training numerous instructors that can go back to their agency now and deliver training on specific topics uh, ones that relate specifically even to the, the EO um, that has been um, released by the governor's office. Um, some of those uh, instructors that we have developed, which can uh, deliver training to their agency now, is we develop the force instructors, um, we develop defensive tactics instructors, developed uh, fundamental skills of crisis intervention instructors, um, otherwise known as uh, crisis intervention training, CIT. Uh, we develop officer wellness instructors. Um, we developed uh, instructors to teach ethics and professionalism. Um, and we've also developed uh, reality-based training instructors to uh, enhance the decision-making skills of officers. Um, those are just to name a few of, um, you know, the, the actions that we've been taking uh, even well before the, uh, this uh, community guidance document has, has uh, been released. Um, in addition to that, we also have online training opportunities, which we're seeing a, a large increase in the usage of online format right now. Um, we have use of force training, uh, training on identification procedures and, and uh, introduction to crime analysis. And even we've taken steps to ensure that um, those instructors and course directors who are, who are delivering training are doing it in accordance with MPT standards as well. So we ensure there's continuity occurring across the state and delivery of the training. And obviously we have, um, uh, you know, a staff here um, that is, is incredibly well versed in the, in the topics that um, they work on and they're available to assist agencies with implementing training programs and, and even coaching instructors as they deliver the training back at their agency. So um, those are just high, very high level, some of the ways that uh, DCGS and specifically the Office of Public Safety um, is available and has provided resources and materials to assist agencies, um, you know, as, as they move forward to uh, advance the, the uh, professionalization of policing. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them as well. No, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, both uh, Michael and Johanna and, and Josh, uh, for for that presentation. It was, it was good to hear that. I was I was glad to uh, to hear Johanna mention about accreditation. Uh, it uh, it appears in that document on page 93, and uh, it uh, it really helps prepare a lot of agencies to address the, this uh, EO. Uh, do, do any other council members have any uh, comments or concerns? Uh, this is Bruce McBride. Um, 
Um, I think uh, keeping this at a high level, um, uh, we have the whole issue of in-service training that uh, Josh went over. And are we at the point in time where there should be some requirement for in-service training for all police officers in New York State? And I'm not talking about um, policing and peace officers in general. Uh, you're thinking something similar to uh, years years ago. We used to have an intermediate uh, course, uh, something like that. Yes, um, we've talked about it before, but um, the, the the stark reality is, is that uh, there are many uh, departments that don't have, um, I'll just say it, um, mandatory use of force, uh, retraining, uh, review of legal issues, um, basically uh, dealing with diversity, um, a whole bunch of topics. And again, I know there's a, we, we have a number of courses and I'm so glad that we do have uh, more, but there still seems to be a major uh, hole um, or void, I should say, uh, in, with regards to training. Um, and, and I'm not worried about basic school, but it, it's what happens after basic school. Okay. Anyone else? I'm sorry. Uh, Josh, can you tell who that is? I cannot. Um, I don't see anybody speak. Bruce, I would just make a quick comment on it. Mike Wood here. I'm obviously not a um, official council member, but um, you know, if accreditation standards are best practices in the field of law enforcement, as we propose, they are, and most believe they are, and within right. those are required, you know, levels of uh, in-service training for an officer on an annual basis. Um, you know, I think the uh, general conclusion would be that, uh, yes, I mean, I can speak to myself personally. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, I think, as you all very well know, as being members of the council, it gives you the authority to propose and recommend certain things, um, you know, to the governor under that, um, you know, you, you know, you have the, the ability to do that. Um, I do think that, um, you know, on a staff level, we'd certainly be prepared to, you know, explore further, um, you know, anything that the council, you know, brings to us to to explore as far as um, content, wh whatever it may be. So it's entirely up to you. Um, I, I think that if you, you stand here in the face of law enforcement and say, um, the, the, I mean, mo most of the top places do it anyway. P places are accredited. Most departments will um, do this type of work anyway and require it internally. But should it be a state requirement? Um, again, I think many people would say yes. I know I would personally. Um, but that's, uh, you know, that's a whole, whole other matter. But uh, you, you tell us what you would like to do in that regard as far as the council, and, um, you know, we'll certainly have more discussions and explore anything you like. Well, I do know, uh, Michael, that the, uh, the Chiefs of Police Association and the Sheriff's Association are having a joint meeting coming up next month, and uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll make sure that that's a topic of discussion. And um, so thank yeah, I you. I to be there, uh, sure. So. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, does uh, anyone else uh, have any commentary? Uh, this is Bruce again. Um, thank you, uh, Michael, for your comments. But yeah, I, I too also agree that accreditation would be the uh, solution to uh, many ills. I know it would create a lot more workflow, um, but there is definitely a, a need for that. Um, you know, and my position has always been if you're in policing and you want policing to be a profession that it has to be accredited and New York State has a great program, so. Well, thank you. And we'll have our council yeah, but just uh, to get, get an idea for those that may not know, there's about 160 agencies, give or take, out of, uh, you know, 500-ish, 500 to 550 uh, departments with police officers and with police departments in the state. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, thanks for all the discussion on that uh, on that issue. Uh, and uh, we have one final informational item on our agenda, which uh, has to do with an instructor's revocation. And uh, Dave Mahaney will address that. Uh, uh, Dave, uh, go ahead. Can you hear me, Chair? Uh, yes, you, you please go ahead, yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Spike and members of the council. Uh, thank you for allowing me to take a few minutes here to update you on a matter involving Mr. Dennis, Dennis Brennan um, and his previously revoked instructor certifications. As some council members may recall, Mr. Brennan was the proprietor of the Peace Officer Training Academy, a for-profit training organization that offered training services to police and peace officers agencies in the Buffalo, New York area. In 2017, Following a review of Mr. Brennan's course of conduct over a 16-year period, division staff proceeded with the revocation of Mr. Brennan's MPTC, General Topics and Firearms Instructor Certifications. And this is pursuant to Part 6023.7 and 6024.5. The revocation proceeding was based on Mr. Brennan's willful disregard of uh, division rules, MPTC regulations, and New York's uh, state uh, criminal procedure law. After carefully reviewing and considering all the submissions in the matter, Commissioner Green determined that each count set forth in the complaint was substantiated. As a result, Commissioner Green revoked all of Mr. Brennan's instructor certifications in November of 2017. Mr. Brennan subsequently challenged the Commissioner's decision in court, but the courts upheld the Commissioner's determination. Concurrent to Mr. Brennan's instructor revocation proceeding, the New York State Office of Attorney General Public Integrity Bureau commenced a criminal investigation against Mr. Brennan based on him knowingly marketing and providing peace officer training courses to civilians. He was fully aware that this was not authorized to issue such certifications to civilians. He also filed false documents with the division pertaining to security guard for, uh, firearms training and engaging in false and misleading advertising regarding an affiliation between the academy, the division, and the MPTC. In February 2020, Mr. Brennan was arrested by the Office of Attorney General and arraigned on 16 counts of offering a false instrument for filing in the first degree. This is related to his security guards firearms training held at the academy. Subsequently, on July 20th, Mr. Brennan pled guilty to one count of offering a false instrument for filing in the first degree and one count of scheme to defraud in the first degree related to the peace officer training held at the academy. The court ordered Mr. Brennan's firearms license to be revoked and directed him to surrender all weapons. Mr. Brennan is scheduled to be sentenced on September 21, 2020. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, any, any, uh, any questions or uh, concerns uh, for Dave? <laughs> Um, yes, uh, it's Bruce McBride again. Okay, here we um, go. Thanks, Sheriff. Um, this is an interesting case, um, and I'm wondering, is there anybody else out there that's offering peace officer training? Um, I know we have pre-service uh, police academies offered um, at through the community colleges, but I'm just wondering, is is this kind of an anomaly or is there other concerns that are doing the same thing? Uh, Mr. Brennan was the main one out of the Mark that was a, a for-profit training organization, meaning he, you know, he was not, he was not tied directly into a peace officer employer or a police agency directly. Uh, we did right. put measures in place to, you know, only take curriculum for approval and certification directly from uh, peace employers and police employers um, to sort of avoid the issues that Mr. Brennan had presented in the past. Um, but he, you know, through schemes of his own, um, tried to bypass those rules, you know, by having third party uh, employers, you know, submit um, rosters with individuals on there for the sole purpose of getting a cert certification and, and really no employment was ever on the table. So that was obviously a concern to the Attorney General's office during the course of their investigation. 
Uh, but to answer your question, you know, I, we're not aware of, of too many others that, that, you know, that, like I said, we've put measures in place to make sure that we're dealing directly with the employer and not so much a private entity uh, that may have the ability to put on training because they have the appropriate instructor certifications. And just to reiterate, yes, yeah, he is much more of an anomaly, um, uh, Dr. McBride, and um, we do have within that, which Dave is overseeing the compliance unit that has taken on a lot of, if we have any complaints on these types of things or other instructors uh, issues that come about that we can act upon in addition to the uh, regulations and the instructor and director um, course that this council has um, supported will is assisting us in trying to hold others accountable when we find out about any information or we learn about it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Dave, for your presentation. Uh, uh, if I could just our, say one thing on that, I just ahead. wanted to acknowledge the work of Dave and others in the staff. This was a lot of work. Uh, it was a long involved investigation, a long involved um, case, and I appreciate uh, the commitment of staff to the integrity of the uh, curriculum and the work that they've done to make sure that the work of this council is carried out appropriately and to take that seriously with regard to this matter. Um, they worked not only to at great length to deal with the matter in our end, but cooperated and assisted uh, the Attorney General with whatever was asked of them. So I just wanted to acknowledge that because it was a great amount of work over a lengthy period of time to get to this point. Okay, yeah, thank you. The, um, obviously, the integrity of our uh, certifications of our instructors is such an important thing. and. Uh, this sounds like it wasn't an easy matter, but it took a lot of time and uh, a lot of staff time. And so we appreciate everything that everyone did. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Dave. Um, thank you. Can I ask a question? I just wondered what was his, uh, was he a peace officer or police officer? How did he um, achieve the instructor development staff? Yeah, so prior to him becoming um, the proprietor of the training academy, he was a correction officer out in uh, Western New York. Um, and he had a very, very short stint as a chief of police um, for a municipality out there. So he was able to obtain his instructor certification through um, those employments. Okay, I was wondering how he would have that. And good work, That good work, that's, uh, that's uh, not, something that should be uh, i reiterate that it's serious you know when you're there's a especially with all the changes that are happening in legis new legislation and to be uh not properly training people and or training people that have no business being trained with information that shouldn't be is a uh, good work by uh, you and your team thank you Thank you. Yeah, and, and especially when it came to the security guard side of it, um, I know that doesn't fall within the MPTC, but, you know, anytime, you know, he's submitting documentation to us saying people have qualified on their weapon when they clearly haven't, obviously that was concerning to the division and to the attorney general. And if I could just reassure you all, his security guard instructor certifications have been revoked also on that side of our house, obviously. Okay, very good. All right, thanks, Chief. Thanks, uh, Dave and Johanna, and uh, thank you to the staff for all the work on that. Uh, uh, under uh, new business, uh, I have uh, uh, nothing to bring up. Uh, the in-service training is something uh, I'm glad we got that out again from the commissioner. Uh, any other new business from anyone? Okay, hearing none, uh, I guess that will conclude our meeting today, and I would uh, ask for a motion uh, to uh, adjourn. Our next meeting is uh, December 2nd, uh, 2020. Um, entertain a motion? Second. Some motion. Motion uh, to second. All in favor, we understand everybody's in uh, favor of that, so... Uh, all right, meeting adjourned, and uh, thank you all very much, uh, and uh, see you all December 2nd. Thanks for everyone's contributions today. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the summer. Bye. Bye. Bye.